Welcome everyone, this is Tim Pullman and you're listening to the SEP Couch. This podcast is all about standard essential patents. We talk about patent strategies, friend licensing, patent pooling and patent litigation. So let's dive into today's episode. She is a general manager, advisor, board member, but in particular, a, ex a licensing executive. I'm very happy to have here, Sonia London. Welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to he be here. This is great having you at my SEP couch. I have heard a lot of panels, you included, and I think it's you have a great mind, and I'm very happy to discuss some of the topics here today. And as I'm always starting, I want to learn about how people came to the topic of standard essential patents, which sounds sometimes as an exotic topic, but more and more gets popular. So maybe if you could start, Sonia, walk us through a little bit your career, what were the different positions you had, and where did you end up today? Okay. Um, well... <laughs> My whole 14 years with Nokia were more or less SCP related. And now I'm working with technology licensing with Taktotec. Um, so you could almost say that I started with SCPs rather than ended up with working with them. Well, anyway, um, the first uh, touch with SCP world for me um, was some 15 years ago when I started with Nokia. And um, um, at the time, um, SCP licensing was mostly a game of licensing your competitors. Um, the era, you could say even that the era of cross-licensing was ending um, and the era of licensing revenues uh, was starting when I started uh, with Nokia. And um, there were later a lot of patent pool discussions, patent divestments, um, in addition to the usual um, licensing discussions and negotiations. My work was mostly around the mobile devices and technology. I, um, I started with uh, managing licensing agreements, uh, creating royalty compliance program for licensing. Later, I was managing patent pool discussions, leading licensing negotiations, uh, resolving uh, disputes. These were mostly contract-based, like royalty disputes uh, that we had. Um, then later, uh, digitalization played a big role for me uh, as IP and uh, licensing needed a different um, operational and contract management than what was used um, in general legal functions. Nokia already, of course, had uh, world-class systems for IP management, and I led building that for a licensing business, so licensing kind of business contract management. Um, my last position with Nokia was leading um, the global licensing business licensing program for consumer electronics. That was Wi-Fi, video standards. Um, this was great fun. Um, we grew the program um, and uh, I, I was doing negotiations all over the world. Now, today, my work is not about SCPs. Um, but I see some efforts uh, ongoing um, in standardization of uh, structural electronics. I can talk more about that. So uh, maybe in a longer term, I will be working with SCPs again. Who knows? Very good. That sounds really interesting. And also, I'm sure very exciting times going from cross-licensing world to a much more, you know, uh, complex world of, of, of revenues. But it's um, exactly that topic that I would love to hear a bit more from you. Um, I think many people sometimes have the perception you own all these gold nugget SEPs and revenue streams come in and you just, you know, wait for it. But um, <laughs> I, I know and I'm sure it's a lot of effort to get there and a lot of um, you need a lot of well trained, well educated people to do it. So can you tell me a little bit about the challenges of SCP licensing, but also maybe some of the success um, that is there that maybe see, people sometimes don't see uh, because it's not you know, so popular like a litigation? Sure. Um, golden nuggets, definitely, they don't turn into money flow. You need to have a lot of things there. And, and uh, um, I can talk about SCP challenges, in a, let's say, generally. Uh, of course, I can't. I can't talk on behalf of Nokia, so this is just me, personal opinions uh, talking. But um, it's not just, it, it's not that simple. Um, you need much more than than even a, a talented team there. 
Um, SAP licensing is not about FRAND or RAND licensing. Um, so as you know, generally, a licensor has committed to fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms of licensing. Now, you can turn this other, another way around. I think that if there would be a party that would be demanding um, terms that would be unfair, unreasonable, and discriminatory, that party would not be making many deals. So from that angle, kind of, it, it's supposed to be very simple, fair, reasonable, and, and non-discriminatory. Uh, the problem here is that the licensor or innovator uh, has committed to something, uh, but the licensee or the implementer has not, meaning commit to license. Only the, there's only one way commitment by the licensor. And the most pressing challenge in the whole picture, making it so difficult is that uh, for friend licensing is that there is a, a large um, extensive phenomena of holdout uh, taking place, meaning that there, there are no licensees taking licensees um, uh, in, in place. So it is just plainly possible uh, to start selling products uh, that infringe SCPs and not take a license. Easy as that. It seems that no term is friend, even if the licensor had dozens of comparable agreements in place for the same technology, if you ask for from the potential licensee, uh, their, their opinion. So nothing works and, and, and they will take no license. They say that nothing is friend, so I'm not gonna take license. This is hold out. So the concept of friend uh, consists of the appropriate valuation of SCPs, but it is also about the fair process to conclude a license. And this means that both parties must come together uh, to the negotiation table with good faith intentions uh, to negotiate and commit uh, to conclude a license in a timely manner. So that the patent holder also in reality is compensated adequately and fairly. Now, many companies uh, who implement technologies will benefit of the massive investments made to create these standards that, that are used. Um, if the companies are not willing to pay front compensation, um, to the patent holders who invested to create the technologies others are using, then this will reduce uh, the incentives of companies to invest in innovation and to participate also in open standardization in the first place. And in the end, this will be harmful for the wider community and uh, for the consumers. So it's only fair that if a company using innovation of other companies is not willing to uh, play with the friend rules and pay for the for the uh, license. Uh, this company should be prevented from using the patented technology. This behavior, if that has been going for a long time, then penalties must follow. In no event can the legal system uh, incentivize holdout. And then I would like to add one interesting point is that um, it's notable that very often um, those who resist licensing the most are some of the most powerful companies in the world and they use their market power against the suppliers and innovators so kind of from the competition law point of view it would be healthier outcome uh, for the industry if the end product manufacturer who actually gets the most profits from using these technologies at least took part in sharing the fair royalty uh, cost instead of forcing this cost burden um, solely to its suppliers and potentially weakening their competitiveness. So kind of, there's a lot of things going on behind those golden nuggets being licensed. I can see. And there, it sounds like there's a lot of delay, but also a lot of back and forth. And I remember very well, uh, you and me, we were together in a panel called the Frand Dance. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a very nice picture, a dance. Um, can you elaborate what part of that licensing negotiations you could picture as a dance? <laughs> I, can, I can do that, surely. And I was really doing that dance for, for many years. So um, this, this friend licensing process uh, is a dance that the parties take together. As you said, it's a lot of back and forth, but uh, it's, um, as I said, it's a, it's a process. And uh, uh, it's important to understand that both parties, both licensee and licensor, implementer, innovator, um, they, they both have obligations. They all both have the steps to take in this dance. And um, both 
both of them need to be willing uh, parties and show that they are negotiating in good faith and show this in, in really in, in every turn of the of the dance that they are they are doing. So okay, willing party negotiating in good faith. What does that mean? Um, a willing party, whether it's a licensee or licensor, um, they would engage in negotiations in a serious and target-oriented manner. Um, they would give timely responses to the other party. Uh, they would use expert resources if they need so, internal or external as needed, even if there would be some cost associated. Um, they would make no delays uh, in any part of the process, and they would make no unreasonable asks. Um, from the other party and they would make serious offers and counter offers. Now this is easy to understand if you turn it other way around. If this is willing, so what is unwilling? And oh, I have seen those cases that are <laughs> very much unwilling. Um, if, we, if we look at that from the unwillingness point of view, uh, an unwilling party who is not negotiating in good faith uh, would not engage into discussion at all or maybe only sometimes when they feel like it, maybe next year or next month or sometimes. They would delay in responses and overall process. Like it's hard to say if, if every little action you must do uh, requires months, it sometimes feels frustrating to the other party. It's not very, uh, the dance is not moving. Um, unwilling party uh, would not use expert resources if needed. They would just say, I don't understand, but they wouldn't do anything about it. They wouldn't retain um, external patent counsel, for example, to understand the patents. They wouldn't take, in, take a look into, into any, any information uh, that is provided to them. Um, they would make unreasonable asks. Uh, for example, what I have seen is like, uh, um, unbalanced NDAs that would um, prevent a party of using its own information, uh, not the other parties, but their own information. Um, there would be, for example, asking information that only courts would have power to request uh, a party to provide. Or <laughs> this is a um, funny example, but a real one, requesting to accept an oral offer within one hour. So no, write, no offer in writing, and you have to accept it in, in 60 minutes starting now. Like, is that uh, really something that, that is a, a willing party, uh, like a target oriented and, and, and good faith negotiations? I don't think so. Um, party would not be making counter offers at all maybe, or they would make counter offers that are clearly uh, unreasonable. And for example, they would not give any value uh, to a patent portfolio that other companies have licensed and are paying for. Um, so that's um, a, a bit weird. Um, unwilling licensee not, would not be concluding a deal in a reasonable time um, or time frame. Of course, this might vary. What is reasonable varies, of course, on a case by case basis. But uh, I have seen that even during the pandemic, it is possible for a willing party to conclude a license uh, like. Um, less than two years. It just does not take that long time. So kind of friend dance is not that difficult. It is all possible to do. But you have to be a good dancer if you have to cope with, <laughs> with that, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but that's that's an interesting, just one question you said, it is possible in two years. So I assume two years is a time frame which for you would be a willing licensee. How does it look for the unwilling ones? Longer than that. I, I don't want to set a, a, a time frame, and, and this is just a personal um, personal view that that I, I understand that things take time. You need to analyze the portfolio. You need to understand. You need to do your your homework and and so forth. And and uh, big uh, big companies um, they they are not that fast in all of their actions. So I understand that things take time, but the two years is is not a, a time limit of being willing or unwilling. But uh, you can tell from the process, if the other party does not want to conclude a deal, it will take time. I've, I've seen a very long negotiations too. Understood. Well, that sounds very long. Um, 
Interesting. Um, what I also think is interesting, you, you started with saying we came from a world of cross-licensing a few companies in the market to out-licensing. You know, we have a lot more companies in the telecom computer space, but um, I think we are starting even in the next area or era um, of a new industry verticals, right? Because the past was mainly handsets and computers. Now we have the automotive space and especially in the past two years, let's say, we had a lot of litigation also here and conflict. And um, you, you, what, what is your thought of that? You see any trends there um, entering these new uh, industry verticals when it goes to, to SEP licensing? Um, I think these verticals go even beyond the automotive. And, and um, uh, there are licensing efforts in, in other sectors and, and uh, verticals uh, too. And I, I think there are maybe some, some things that, that, that always happen. First, um, I, I think that um, it's not uh, like SAP licensing that inevitably would lead to something like, like litigations or, 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 or something like that. This typically would follow from a continued holdout. Um, but um, and we need to remember that there are also other, other ways to, to resolve things uh, than litigation, also arbitration and so on. I, I think that, that this will be used more um, in, in SEP litigation in, in coming years. Yeah. The litigation landscape is getting, getting difficult, let's say. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, that if you think about the new sectors and new verticals, uh, what comes first um, is the development of licensing models for the industry and then trying out whether they work or not. Like uh, automotive industry, as we know, had different IP model than what telecoms had. And there was a period of time where industries were needing, they needed to find a way um, to, to find a way to license that was working. And I think that the success of uh, Avanci program uh, seems to prove that the industries have found a way to, to do this. So first, um, development of, of licensing model. And uh, um, if and when these new verticals are using SCPs, then uh, licensing models and licensing programs, they will follow. Um, and then they will have to try out what works. Uh, what has worked for telecom and, and also for automotive may not work for, for example, um, energy sector. And uh, the new models for licensing may be needed. Um, I, I could think of an example that if you are used to license per product, and this is the way you are pricing your licenses, you will need to find a new way to license when the products are different. Like if you have automated factory as a service, how do you license that? Are you going per camera or, or per node or, or server or, or do you just license the whole thing? There's definitely no answers to this, but uh, when we are going into new sectors, we need to take a more holistic look on, 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 on what's possible and how should we um, go in there. And then um, when these new models emerge, um, after they have emerged, then uh, we will probably also see litigation emerging if there are no other ways to resolve it, things. So um, it, it may be that, that in the future, more uh, disputes will be resolved in, in arbitration instead of litigation. Who knows? We'll see. And, and thinking about also the technologies that have evolved, um, you think 5G is going to be a, a game changer? I mean, at least what we see from the data uh, we have a lot more patent owners these days than we had also just five years ago. Um, how will 5G, in your view, be different? Or is it just more of the same and, and many things will be similar to 4G? Um, well, I think that as a technology, if we talk about technical point of view, 5G would definitely be a game changer. Um, with regard to licensing, um, there, well, you know this, there's a, a patent landscape ownership race ongoing. You know all about this because of your products. Um, and, and, and this seems to be, for me at least, uh, it seems to be a much bigger game ongoing than what it was at the time for 4G. Um, maybe there's more fragmented um, patent ownership in 5G uh, than it was in, in, in 4G. So may, maybe that's the reason. But kind of from licensing point of view, at least for now, it seems that uh, uh, 5G 
will be another better technology to license uh, so that licensing itself doesn't require changes because of 5G. Uh, but it might be that the changing market landscape um, with like more products and services to, to license, like IoT as an example, that those might need uh, different uh, licensing approaches, I think. Well understood. Um, you said in the beginning you are, you know, recently not that much involved with SEPs um, anymore, and I think um, that gives us also a chance to compare a bit the differences. You are now the general counsel and licensing executive for Tacotech. Um, maybe give us some understanding. Um, what is what are what are the re responsibilities in your new positioning, and could you? Tell us maybe also about differences when we talk about licensing. How is SEP licensing different, for example, to patent licensing or even technology licensing? Could you elaborate on that? Okay. Um, I will first tell a little bit about what Tactotech is doing because right. that leads us to technology licensing and, and then the differences in there. So, um, and this is very interesting, even if it's not SAPs, because sure. this is a, a fundamental change in uh, electronics and how electronics are made. So uh, Tactotech uh, technology will transform the global electronics industry by merging the mechanics and electronics into molded uh, smart surfaces, kind of a bunch of components become one beautiful part. So I think it's very exciting to see um, the electronics industry changing from components in a box into smart, smooth 3D surface that actually is doing things. It's smart. Uh, our main customers are automotive industry, uh, but we see huge uh, growth potential in industrial and home appliances sectors too. So uh, what this is and why is it so big is that Tactotech enables sustainability like never seen before in electronics. Our technology reduces um, the plastic material used by 50 to 80 percent. So more components into one piece reduces plastic material used, huge number, and enables use of bio-based or recycled materials. And then um, minus 35 to 60-ish um, percent less greenhouse gas emissions uh, during the manufacturing process of the electronics including materials and components. And this is huge. I mean, think about what this means for European or Chinese car industry, for example. If you can reduce the plastic material used by 50 to 80% and, and greenhouse gas emissions from 35 to 60% in the, in the making. So what it means to environment, what it means to the whole industry, it's, the impact will be huge in reducing materials and greenhouse gas emissions. So kind of, um, that's the starting point for me, very in the interesting uh, technology and, and very interesting and familiar business model for me as we're doing technology licensing. Maybe just so, one question in that regard, yeah. Sonia, to have a picture to it. What, what in a car would Taco Tech technology be integrated? Is it the board computer or how can I imagine it? It could be, uh, for example, um, overhead control panel where you have the lamp lights and, and controls. Okay. It could also be controlling systems that you use with your hands and, and panels. It could be illumination in panels, exterior, interior, and, and, and so on. Oh, okay. um, check our website, tactotech.com, because Perfect. it's very interesting. You can see some demos that are beautiful. And it also shows the, the future of the car industry, what we will be seeing in a few years time. So um, that's that's very interesting uh, thing. Great. So um, as a general counsel of Tactotech, I will be responsible for all legal matters. However, due to my background in IP, I will be working especially uh, around the IP strategy, of course, and, and a general strategy of, of the company as, as it comes to the technology licensing and how do we do that, um, standardization efforts and so on. But of course, there are new areas for me. Um, uh, um, corporate law, finance, funding, insurances, employment, compliance stuff, and, and uh, um, all, the, all the things um, that lawyers consider to be great and interesting. <laughs> so um, kind of when I left Nokia, I was looking for a more extensive role 
uh, which would be in the deep core of, of, of business and involve licensing. And, and, and that's what I, what I found is this technology licensing company, which kind of brings us to the technology licensing and what it is compared to the SCP uh, licensing. So um, before going there, I would just remind that, that we need to think about licensing and the IP strategy in whole as a, like a holistic approach. You will understand that when, when we are talking about kind of access to technology and how to, how to do that uh, from strategic point of view. So technology licensing is very interesting uh, and, and challenging area of work. Um, the technology, first of all, has to be uh, mature enough uh, so that customers can have something uh, new and usable for which they are paying for. So technology licensing typically would include license to patents, but it also in, would include license to something else. So it's not pure patent licensing. Uh, there could be uh, know-how, trade secrets. Um, they could include software. There could be databases, specifications, material testing results, process recipes, designs, design instructions, and so on. So uh, a lot of things included in there. Um, difference uh, between the SCP licensing um, and technology licensing is that uh, SCP licensing is pure patent licensing, where there are typically no deliverables. So teachings of the patents, they are available uh, publicly. And the ones who use SCPs and should pay for fair royalty, um, they are available already. So oftentimes um, customers don't even know what is included in their products because they just use components. Um, and it may be a surprise to them uh, later on that they would need to pay for someone to continue doing what they are already doing. So <laughs> this means that licensees perception towards SCPs or royalty payments in general may be many, very negative from that point of view. A uh, customer does not feel that they get anything uh, worth of paying for. And uh, this is something that the licensors need to be able to demonstrate and, and communicate better. Now, in technology licensing, uh, on the other hand, there are deliverables uh, provided, uh, which otherwise without license would not be available at all. So if customer is able to get uh, something that is cheaper, better, faster, stronger, or more sustainable and eco-friendlier, then there is something to pay for. And the license gives uh, access to technology, which again is a very strategic uh, point to think about in, in all companies. So customers own product development may advance several years in one big leap only by taking a technology license. So it will enable access to technology. And uh, this makes the customer's perception uh, towards technology license more positive. So of course, the, the pricing discussion is always present in there too, but the, the perception is different and you can tell the difference when you're doing licensing. No, that is really interesting. And I, I could see a lot of also, like there's a knowledge transfer part to it where it's more like a corporation rather than ask, as you said, asking yes. money, right? Yes, definitely. Which is, which is probably exactly why this SEP business is, is sometimes uh, so difficult, but also you're, you're not, you know, the, everyone's friend because it feels like all you do is asking for money, right? Sometimes they may feel like that, but they didn't see the efforts put into standardization yeah. and the R&D, like the, the tens and hundreds of millions that the others have in, uh, invested into creating those standards. So that might not be visible and, um, that probably should be discussed more in the industry to demonstrate that that there right. is something to benefit for. And, and I could also see, especially these days where you license to OEMs that themselves just implement a box, you know, that just works. Um, so they themselves not really implemented the technology or anything, all that, you know, they feel like just paying that perception makes it even more difficult when the technology somehow is hidden in the value chain. Yes, that, that's, that's, and, and many OEMs would like to keep it simple and, and continue doing like that. But uh, the burden for the supply chain is, is, is um, another question. And um, the parties should seek to find a model that works for licensing. 
Yeah, very interesting to see those different levels, technology, patents, SAP, licensing that put some more perspective to, you know, the work of, of what a licensing executive does. Um, yes. But that ties into my next question. You are not only a licensing executive. Um, looking at your LinkedIn page, you also wear some other hats. And this is more like a question towards your career. What is your passion outside of that? Um, I see you are a board member with startups. You are a member of other associations. Uh, could you elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Um, I like the way you put it, wearing um, a number of different hats, because that's exactly what it is. Um, I, I do board work um, and advisory work. Uh, and, and, and this is interesting, that hat to wear is, is very interesting because uh, these companies keep my mind fresh um, with new viewpoints and something new to learn. It's, it's great that uh, you can learn with like cool technologies that you didn't know before, like federated learning in AI or, <laughs> or something like that, um, and industries uh, that you didn't know before. And, and then uh, seeing that there's something to give to them that they can benefit from, from what I have to give. And they, they teach me, I teach them, so I can make a difference for those companies um, with my strategy and, and IP expertise to kind of help them steer with the, with the ocean of, of patents and, and, and so on. Um, I've been a board member, um, an advisor, sometimes also a small minority investor in a number of, of software, as I mentioned, AI companies. There are, have been some deep tech, which is very patent centric, very interesting, um, which mostly they have been a startups and, and small companies. But on the other hand, during my Nokia time, it was very refreshing and, and hands on uh, thinking on, on kind of you come from a big corporation and then you're working with startups. And, and uh, I, I think it also uh, helped me a little bit uh, to get started with, with Taktotech, which is, is, is smaller, definitely uh, a lot smaller company than, than what Nokia, Nokia is. So currently I do serve um, as a board member in IP services sector, uh, cloud software, uh, engine technology uh, companies. And, and then another hat, which is the nonprofit hat. Um, equally important, I would say. Uh, I'm, I'm serving as a um, um, board member uh, of a Licensing Executive Society International, which is international nonprofit for, for licensing professionals and, and also for its uh, Scandinavia branch uh, board. And um, this is another viewpoint for working for nonprofits um, that um, it gives you the other angle of the world. Um, it gives the opportunity to connect with people uh, around the world, you know, create networks with great professionals, and uh, to hear what's hot on other industries that I don't know about, like organizing a webinar for a nonprofit, and then you finally, you, you end up learning a lot of, of medical tech uh, patent situation and pharma patents and so on, so, which is very interesting. Otherwise, I would not come, come across uh, that. So anywhere I go, I can call to a, someone I know about uh, in IP profession everywhere in the world, pretty much. So uh, being able to learn from others by serving them. So I, I, I think it's, it's just a great, a great uh, trade-off. So um, uh, having like um, many professional activities um, at the same time, many hats uh, that I'm wearing, uh, that kind of lets me have uh, different parts to explore and Kind of, it's meaningful. It's really meaningful to be able to 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 help others and and, and learn more my, myself. So something new every day. <laughs> That's the way it should be. Very very good, Sonia. Thank you so much for getting some insights about the world of licensing, your, your personal career path, and um, as always, I'm ending um, this this podcast with giving you the chance to you know, give your final statement about what people should keep remembering from this, from you, from your thoughts and ideas. Wow. Um, okay. I, I think I mentioned the strategy, um, a holistic approach a couple of times. So uh, what I have been advocating mostly to these companies with my many hats on, um, I, I would say that IP and licensing, also SCP licensing, should not be a uh, uh, should be thought in a holistic and, and strategic way. Um, but this means that, that uh, IP strategy is not that 
just about creating a portfolio with your patent filing strategy or whether you take a license to SCPs. That's not it. IP and, and licensing strategy is about using IP to build shareholder value by using it, using your IP strategically, uh, like ensuring access to technology, maybe by taking a SCP license or technology license. It may be ensuring freedom of action for your company, building the very important ecosystems, taking part in standardization, for example, creating revenue or other economical benefits than re revenue, which is possible by using IP well. So IP should be thought, managed, and used strategically uh, with a holistic approach uh, to be able to realize the full benefits that it has, the full potential. Very good. Thank you so much. That was Sonia London um, at my virtual SEP couch. It was great having you. Um, I wish you all the best for your new position, and I hope to talk soon. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.